Thanks, and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, for those who were attending the mini course last week, um, that was fairly technical and we were proving a lot of things. So this is gonna be a change of pace. I'm basically not gonna prove anything. It's gonna be a very soft talk where we just kind of review. Uh, first of all, the, the elliptic theory of quantitative rectifiability of which there's a very richly developed theory due to the Vita and Sims, uh, with contributions more recently by, by some other people. Um, and then we'll discuss a little bit about recent developments towards developing a, a parabolic analog of the David Sums theory, which is still in a, a much more limited form. It's not nearly as well developed as the elliptic situation. And part of that is because um, there are some things that are just kind of fundamentally different. Um, those of you that have worked on parabolic problems know that when you try to extend elliptic results to the parabolic setting, three things can happen. Often things just extend routinely. You just tweak things a little bit technically and it works. Um, sometimes it extends, but there are some significant obstacles and you have to come up with something new in order to prove the parabolic analog. And then some things, sometimes it's just impossible. Sometimes there are things that are true in the elliptic world that simply are not true in the parabolic world. So what, when I discuss the parabolic situation, I want to sort of try to emphasize a bit how things differ compared to the elliptic situation. Um, what are some of the, the obstacles that are new and different and including some of the things that just simply aren't true, okay? So first of all, let's begin with a little bit of history and background. Okay, so there's of course also a rich qualitative theory which I'm not really gonna discuss at all, but let me just mention in passing, defiability. Uh, this is the, of course, the classical, the Sokovich Federer theory, uh, which says, okay, to simplify my life, and because this is the only situation we're dealing with at the present in the parabolic world, I'm always gonna consider only the co-dimension one case. So whether I'm in the elliptic or parabolic setting, my ambient space is always gonna be Rn plus one. I'll be thinking of a set that's of co-dimension one. And so um, rectifiability means that that sigma, which I'll tell you what that is in a minute, is of E minus a union of Lipschitz graphs is equal to zero. So E is covered up to a set of measure zero by a countable family of Lipschitz graphs. Uh, sigma here is gonna be Hausdorff HN measure restricted to E. Okay, in an elliptic setting, this is always gonna be what it's gonna, this is always what sigma will be. Um, we have to tweak this a little bit in the parabolic world. Okay, because of the difference in homogeneity. All right. Um, of course, this is a qualitative property. It's, uh, this is a qualitative situation geometrically. And therefore, the, when you tie this, which you can do, to various harmonic analysis properties, those are also going to be qualified, um, qualitative. Um, so for example, so this is tied to qualitative harmonic analysis properties. For example, um, existence of principal values of SIOs, singular integral operators, uh, contributions here of Matula, Price, Tulsa, uh, and also, um, absolute continuity of harmonic measure with respect to sigma um, in the presence of some connectivity. And there's 
been a lot of work done in this qualitative area, but I won't mention every, nearly everything. I'm just gonna mention the first thing, which is more than hundred years old. And that is the classical theorem of FNM Reese. All right. But this qualitative theory is not really my, my emphasis today. I wanna emphasize the quantitative analog of this theory. And it was David and Sems who basically created this from more or less from scratch, um, starting in the 1990s. Um, so this requires a couple of definitions to say what this is about. So um, again, I remind you, we're always in the co-dimensional one case. So we first need a definition the notion of Alfa's regularity or Alfa's David regularity. I don't know if De Guy is uh, listening remotely. He won't like it if I put his initial in there, but I'm going to do it. So Alfa's David regularity just means that, that um, with uniform implicit constants, the sigma measure of a surface ball delta R is always on the order of R to the N. Okay, and delta R here, a surface ball, what I mean by that is it's, it's a Euclidean ball intersected with my set E centered on E. Okay, uh, oh, and this should be sort of implicit in the definition, E is a closed set. So typically we define offers or offers to feed regularity to be uh, applying to closed sets. All right. So then the next definition, which I'll abbreviate for henceforth is UR for short. So this stands for uniform rectifiability. In other words, quantitative rectifiability. Um, there are many characterizations of, of, this, uh, of this property due to David and Sems and some subsequently to other people. Um, so we have some liberty about how we're gonna take the definition. So I'm gonna take the definition as follows based on the, so always here from now on, E will be ADR. So implicitly we're assuming that, okay? So these definitions apply to ADR sets, all right? So then E is gonna be UR if it satisfies GL, the geometric lemma, which actually was first introduced by Peter Jones in connection with what he called the analyst traveling salesman problem. So what does the geometric lemma say? It says we, we're gonna define a quantity, beta of R and X, and let me define the square of it. It's gonna be defined to be the mean value over the surface ball delta R of X of, uh, sorry, I need to take an infimum here. I'll tell you what I'm taking the infimum over in a second. P is going to be a hyperplane. Uh, bad notation, that should be a Y. All right, so what are we taking the average of here? We're taking the distance from Y to, uh, to a hyperplane P, dividing by the scale R, squaring it, we take the average of that, then we take the infimum over all hyperplanes P, okay? So the infimum runs over all N planes because we're in N plus one dimensions. So this is measuring somehow quantitative flatness because then the condition is the criterion that the measure d mu of Rx defined to be 
beta squared of Rx dr over Rdx is a Carlson measure on zero infinity cross E. E endowed with a sigma measure. Uh, and I, when I write dx, I should write d sigma of x. All right. Okay, so meaning that um, the soup over all, let's say z and e, and all r bigger than zero of one over r to the n integral zero to uh, diameter, uh, no, zero to r integral over delta r of z, beta squared of rx uh, dx dr over r d sigma of x dr over r is, which we'll call the, the Carlson norm of mu, is finite. Okay. All right. So let me point out that this is a condition of quantitative flatness, right? Because somehow these betas are measuring proximity to a hyperplane. And for this quantity to be finite, notice that it's not enough that the betas just be bounded. They've actually got to be kind of small a lot of the time, all right? So you're not just close to hyperplane, you're, you're quite close quite often, all right? So this is a, a quantitative version of flatness. Of course, qualitative rectifiability in some sense is also about flatness, right? It's almost everywhere existence of approximate tangent planes, that sort of thing. Okay, this is kind of an analog to that, all right? So there are many characterizations of uniform rectifiability. Let me begin by many of the classical ones due to David and Sims. And other people later. Um, so always again, he's going to be ADR. Maybe I should write that. And I'm only going to state the code I mentioned one case, as I said before, but, um, there's actually a well-developed theory in the, in the higher code I mentioned case as well. All right. Okay. So first one, this is due to David Sems going back to 91 is that E is UR infinite only if all nice calderon Zygmunt type singular integral operators bounded on L2. Of course, with respect to this signal measure. All right. Another characterization a couple of years later is you are if and only if um, E satisfies the bilateral weak geometric lemma, okay? Bilateral weak geometric lemma, okay? All right, so what is that? That says the following thing. Um, so given two positive constants, we're thinking of the eta as small and the K is possibly being kind of big. There exists a decomposition of the dyadic cubes of E all right, so let me just digress for a second. This ADR property allows one to construct a family of a grid, a uh, grid in quotes, of cubes in quote on the on E itself um, that have and enjoy 
basically all the properties that you would like that dyadic cubes enjoy. All right. Um, in the setting of the in the ADR setting, this is originally due to Guy David. Uh, there is a generalization, sort of a far-reaching generalization, uh, a few years later due to Michael Christ that everyone knows about. Uh, the refinements of that due to Putinen and Karama. All right. So it's a very useful and important property about. Well, basically sets with some kind of doubling property. ADR is more than enough to do this. All right. So these divide into the dyadic cubes split into two parts, again, depending on the parameters A and K, the good ones and the bad ones, in such a way that um, in such a way that first the bad cubes pack, meaning that for all Q in this dyadic grid, um, if you look at the sum of the Q primes contained in Q, such that Q prime is a bad one, sum up their measures, it's gonna be bounded depending on eight and K by the sigma measure of the, of the top cube Q, okay? And second, I'm gonna do, rather than take time to write out the exact criterion, I'm just gonna draw you a picture. I think that illustrates things better. So you have your cube Q here on the set E, all right? And the condition, is that there's a plane P, a hyperplane, um, such that if I look within a large ball centered roughly on Q of diameter K time or of radius K times the diameter of Q, and I make a sandwich here of thickness eta diameter of Q, then my set E is always trapped in the sandwich inside that big ball. But moreover, the proximity here is in the Hausdorff distance sense. So not only is the set close to the plane, but the plane is close to the set, which means not only are you in a sandwich, but the holes, if there are any, can not be any bigger than this. Okay? All right. So that's the second thing. So again, this is a sort of quantitative flatness. And let me emphasize that this is a so-called Carlson set condition. Meaning a property whereby there's some good cubes that have a nice property and there's some bad cubes that pack and that's what you know, all right? And it's kind of a powerful fact that for elliptic uniform rectifiability, conditions of this type actually characterize uniform rectifiability. Okay. All right. So this was a big deal and useful. Come back to that in a moment. All right. Uh, another characterization is that E is UR if and only if. It has a corona decomposition. With respect to Lipschitz graphs. Okay, what does this mean? It means that, again, for all eight and K as in here, there's a decomposition, once again, into good cubes and bad cubes, such that first, the bad cubes pack. Okay, this is exactly the same as here. Second, though, there's going to be a subtle difference from the, this Carlson set condition. 
Second, such that uh, the, the, the good cubes G further subdivide into disjoint coherent trees that we'll call S uh, such that um, the maximal cubes in the tree These guys pack, okay? All right. And third, such that for each S, there exists a Lipschitz graph, gamma S, for which we have this kind of proximity, but not to a hyperplane anymore to the, to the Lipschitz graph, uh, not in the Hausdorff distance sense necessarily, but such that, okay, here's the picture. Um, we're working at scale of K times the diameter of Q. Um, we have some Lipschitz graph here. Oh, I should have said the Lipschitz graph with a small constant uh, with Lipschitz norm, say less than or equal to eta. Um, and such that inside this bigger, this dilated version uh, of the ball, um, the distance from the set E to gamma S is less than or equal to eta times the diameter of Q. And this is for all Q and S. Okay, so let me point out the, the, the maybe subtle but significant difference between this and the, and the packing condition here. Here in the packing condition, the, the, uh, the bilateral weak geometric lemma, um, the good cubes were each good individually. Each cube had its own plane that it was close to in the Hausdorff distance sense. Uh, oh, well, what I mean is the E within this ball. Maybe, let me call this ball BQ star. And what I should have written is that this is E intersect BQ star. Yeah, that's what I, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Shabby, you're right. Okay. All right, which includes Q, but it's just like, it's a dilated version of Q, yeah. Okay. So each in the bilateral weak geometric lemma, in principle, each cube has its own plane and the cube is good or bad individually, okay? But here the cubes have this grouping into not too many trees because the, the maximal cubes in the trees pack. So they're not too many trees. And throughout the tree, there's one universal graph gamma S such that E is close to gamma right, in this fattened version of all the cubes, okay? All right, so on the face of it, this is a stronger thing. Although in the elliptic case, it turns out that they're equivalent they, because they're both equivalent to uniform rectified line. They're both equivalent to this. Question? Oh, yeah, okay, no worries, no worries. Oh, geez. I am uh, not using my time wisely here. Okay. All right. Um, so some more recent characterizations and related results. First, um, Nazarov, Tolson, Volberg. This was when in 2014. Is that E is UR 
is actually implied by just having uh, a very small number of singular integrals, very special singular integrals being bound on L2. And that's the gradient of the single layer potential. Okay, S equals the single layer potential for the Laplacian. Of course, the other direction is already subsumed in the earlier work of David and Sems, right? Because this is, in particular, this is a nice singular integral. So we already knew that this implied this, but the, the new thing was, was this. Oh, I should also mention that there was an earlier version in the case where, the, where n equals one, in, in my terminology, uh, that it was due to Melnikov, uh, Matula, Melnikov, and Verdera. Um, okay. Um, second is that E is U R if and only if uh, bounded harmonic functions. in Rn plus one minus E satisfy Carlson measure estimates, which means that um, integral from zero to R, integral delta R, grad U squared, delta of X dx. Here, this is the distance to, to E. that this should be less than or equal to, um, well, we need to normalize by the L infinity norm uh, times R to the N, which is of course, since we're in the ADR world comparable to this guy, okay? So one direction of this, um, this direction is joint work with Jim Martell and Svetlana Mabiroda, that's 2016 in the opposite direction is due to Garnett, Morgoglu, and Tulsa a couple of years later. Okay. And then let me mention one related thing, uh, which is something that just appeared recently, fairly recently, uh, joint with Jonas Azam, Chim Martel, Mahalas Morgoglu, and Javi Tulsa which is that um, is you are plus some um, weak connectivity. I won't take time to get into that. Oh, this is assuming not just ADR, but also, yes? Ball intersected with, oh. <laughs> Uh, I wrote it wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, an X with X for X in, in E. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, assuming that E is the boundary of some domain, E is ADR, and omega satisfies a corkscrew condition, which says this, that if you have a ball of radius R centered on the boundary, then if omega is on this side, then there's a, a point inside whose distance to the boundary is bigger than a constant times R. All right. So this is true if and only if, I won't, take time to write down what this is, but this means that the Dirichlet problem is solvable with data in LP for some finite P. And that means that you specify the data in LP and you have non-tangential control of the, of the, the control of the non-tangential maximal function of the solution in LP. All right. Okay. So, Ah, I'm burning up my time here. There was one other thing that I wanted to mention, which is the notion of big pieces. I may have to scrap that. Um,
Let's just go right to the parabolic setting, okay? In these last 15 minutes or so. If I have time to talk about big pieces, I will. We'll, we'll, we'll go back and recapitulate, okay? So here again, the motivation is, well, singular integral theory and potential theory, boundary value problems. All right. So um, again, my ambient space is gonna be Rn plus one, but Rn plus one here is gonna be space time, Rn plus one. So, so T of course will be a time variable. All right. Um, we'll define a parabolic length of a vector xt. And that, this is the natural homogeneity for parabolic problems that you count t as the square root. Okay. And let me define a parabolic cube in the following way. So for me, I'm gonna have the time axis run horizontally and there could be up to N dimensions this way. And a parabolic cube IR has dimensions R in all the space variables and R squared in the time variable. All right, so let's notice that, that um, in Rn say, if this is an n-dimensional picture, the volume of I, IR is gonna be R to the n plus one, all right? So I'm gonna let from henceforth, D equals n plus one is gonna be the so-called homogeneous dimension of parabolic Rn. And then for a co-dimension one set E contained in parabolic spacetime Rn plus one, we're gonna define sigma on E to be parabolic Hausdorff measure of, the, of parabolic dimension and plus one restricted to E. And this means you're, this is defined in the same way as standard Hausdorff, uh, Hausdorff measure, except that you cover by uh, parabolic cubes rather than standard cubes or by cubes whose diameter measured in the parabolic distance is at most a certain size. Um, and then the power that you raise the diameter to is n plus one, okay? All right. So then some quick definitions. PADR, um, parabolic ADR means that with this sigma, R to the D is comparable to sigma of delta R. And here delta R is gonna be an N plus one dimensional parabolic cube IR intersect with sigma. Of course, this will be centered on the, on the set E. All right. And then the definition of parabolic uniform rectifiability, which was introduced in joint work with John Lewis and Kai Nistrom, <coughs> is that um, the parabolic version of the geometric lemma holds. Okay, so it works the same way, exactly the same way. Uh, one slight tweak is that here the hyperplanes P should be parallel to the T axis. 
meaning they contain a line parallel to the t-axis. Okay, and that's the natural thing. Um, if you've specialized to the case of graphs, think of parabolic door and sorrow type results, you see that this is the natural thing to do. All right, um, so the original motivation here for introducing these guys was to study um, Kinnick Toro type free boundary problems for the Poisson kernel. in the parabolic setting. Of which we were partly successful and the problem eventually was solved completely by Max Engelstein in his, in his thesis in Chicago. All right, so there are some immediate issues here. Um, first of all, we saw earlier, especially uh, in this um, corona characterization, that Lipschitz, or even in the original definition of rectified millet itself, that Lipschitz graphs are somehow fundamental to the subject in the elliptic case. But it turns out that uh, the right substitute in the parabolic world for Lipschitz graphs is not lip one one half graphs. Okay. Uh, for example, there was a conjecture of Hunt that DP should hold for some finite P in a domain with a lip one one half boundary. Okay, so this would have been a parabolic analog of Dahlberg's theorem, but it's false. There's a counter example of Kaufman and Wu. In Okay, moreover, um, another problem is that Carlson set conditions do not characterize parabolic you are. All right. Uh, and that's unfortunate because, um, well, I guess I've erased them now, but some of these results that I mentioned previously in the elliptic world, um, in particular, the result of Nazarov, Tolson, Volberg, and also this result on solvability, the joint work with Zam and Martel and Morgaglu and Tulsa. Um, those both rely in a serious way on Carlson set conditions. Okay, so, which means that in the parabolic world, something is going to have to give there. All right, so this is one of those cases where some things just are, are impossible in the parabolic case. Doesn't mean the results are impossible, but you're not gonna go by a Carlos set condition, at least not just by itself, okay? Uh, why is this not true? Oh, well, because why Carlos set conditions don't work? Well, okay, because, um, right, a moment ago, I just said that the, lip one one half graphs are not good enough, okay? So it turns out that um, there exist lip one one half graphs. You can construct by hand a lip one one half graph um, for which parabolic ge geometric lemma fails, okay? So it's not, it's not uniformly rectifiable in the parabolic sense. And yet bilateral weak geometric lemma holds, 
And the idea, this is a construction due to Lewis and Silver, basically. Uh, and the idea is to cook up a graph where the modulus of continuity is just a little bit better than t to the one half. It has a logarithmic improvement at small scales. And somehow you can see then that the, that gives you bilateral weak geometric lemma. It gives you the packing for the bad cubes. And yet, yet it's not, it doesn't satisfy the geometric lemma. Okay. All right. Um, That's not like the bilateral weak geometric lemma. Um, that's a good question. But the thing is basically all the Carlson set conditions that we have are things that you can sort of routinely see. I mean, not even a posteriori where we know an elliptic setting they're all equivalent, but even just sort of directly, you can see that they're a priori uh, implied by bilateral weak geometric lemma. Pretty much all the David Sedm's Carlson set conditions that I can think of that characterize uniform rectal family, you can kind of just see by hand directly that they are a consequence of bilateral weak geometric lemma, all right? Or that, um, that they're a priori, no, I should say it this way, that they're a priori uh, weaker than bilateral weak geometric lemma. So, if by, so the philosophy is if, if BWGL doesn't characterize, then these other guys aren't gonna work either because they're even a priori weaker, okay? Um, that's a good question. Maybe, maybe there's something that we haven't thought of. Right, but it would have to be kind of something off the wall that's new and not not one of the conditions that that one has, has encountered in the elliptic setting. Okay, all right. Um, so in these last four minutes, um, let me just say the following. So the it turns out that the correct substitute. For um, for lip one one half is what we've come to call regular lip one one half. Okay, um, and these are well. One way to say it is that these are regular, or this, these are lip one one half graphs. which satisfy the geometric lemma, okay? And we know that not all lip one one half graphs do this, okay? There are other ways to characterize this in terms of the half order time derivative belonging to parabolic BMO of Rn, okay? I won't take time to write that down, all right? But we know these are the right ones now because, because um, it turns out that for lip one, one half graph, we have that, um, let's call it sigma. You know that sigma is our lip, if and only if all nice parabolic singular integrals, SIOs are bounded on L2. This is partly due to Lewis and Murray and partly due to me. Um, Odd in the space variable uniformly in time. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is just for graphs, John. No, 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 but also the issue of those are all Oh, that's the least that you're saying for non Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I see. Yeah, I mean, yeah, these are. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so yeah, um, let's see. Um, second thing is that sigma is an R lip if and only if um, DP is solvable in a domain above the graph, okay? 
Um, and this is a recent result. This is, in fact, this was the topic of my uh, mini course last week. This is joint work with Simon Bortz, um, Shemma Martel, Kai Nystrom. All right. Um, and of course, sigma is parabolic UR, if and only if it's R lip, because, well, that's what you need to get the geometric lemma. So this is sort of obvious. Okay, so, gosh. I, oh, uh, if and only if uh, sigma is R lip. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So I've kind of basically run myself out of time here. So let me just say in conclusion, uh, just a couple words about the, uh, the differences in the novelties uh, that happen. All right. So um, I guess one big thing, as I've mentioned, is that there's this lack of Carlson set conditions. So this is a significant obstacle. Um, there's, um, what do I wanna just say in words? Um, there's one other thing that I want to say is that this is a characterization, this joint work with Simon Bortz, John Hoffman, um, Jose Luis Luna and Kai Nistrom was that is that um, E is parabolic UR, if and only if it satisfies a parabolic version of the corona condition, uh, if and only if it satisfies big pieces squared of um, our lip graphs, okay? So this is meaningful only to those of you that know what big pieces means, but it's a way of saying that you have ample, at each scale, you have ample coincidence with a good set. And VP squared means that you have ample coincidence with sets that have ample coincidence. Um, the interesting thing here, the thing that's kind of new and different, one direction is kind of routine. The thing that's and hence, hence you are. This is a, this is easily seen to be equivalent to you parabolic you are. The new and interesting thing is this direction, uh, because first this is, it actually turns out to be a generic property, and it turns out that corona in terms of any family of ADR sets gives you BP squared of that same family. And the second thing. Um, that's interesting here is that this is, I mean, it's not just very generic, it's, it's very general. It, it holds in this, this generic sense, it holds in, in metric spaces. It's not even a, it's just this sort of very general fact that corona applied BP squared. And I say, I guess that's probably the most novel thing that's arisen in this at this point. So anyway, I've run my time over by about three minutes. So let me stop here. Thanks for your attention.